Last speaker of the day, not the least, Ioannis Sotiropoulos from the University of Minho. He's a FCT investigator, PI at the ICVS Institute of Medical School, University of Minho in Portugal. His research work focuses on understanding the orchestrating role of environmental risk factors. For instance, chronic stress on the onset of Alzheimer's disease with specific focus on the relationship between AD and depression, a stress-related disorder, as you know. Dr. Storipoulos has molecular, electrophysiological and behavior expertise on tau protein and its involvement on pathological brain aging. He has previously trained and worked at Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry in Germany, Columbia University in the United States, Rick and Brain Science Institute in Japan, MRC Center for Synaptic Plasticity in the UK, and Medical School of Athens in Greece. Please welcome with me Dr. Storipoulos to the floor for his lecture on Tau Therapeutics in Stress-Driven Brain Pathology, Exploring the Path from depression to Alzheimer's disease. Sounds very interesting. Welcome. Thank you. Oops. Her Majesty, dear all, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity. So I have to admit that in this session, uh, I learned uh, at least what happened in my brain when my girlfriend, at least in the beginning, was rejecting me all the time. So I think it's, that's the author's <laughs> genes. As well, the fact that uh, the endocannabinoids lover, uh, Bob Marley, never developed Alzheimer, correct? So, but I I'm going to be a bit different today with scaring you in a way that you're thinking that your daily life and life stressors is going to be a bit, you know, bad for your brain. Uh, so, I have here the slide. So, I think you already hear in the morning that uh, World Health Organization has uh, declared this priority health problem for his next plan until 2025, dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And indeed, as you see, the numbers which you heard some in the morning are very scary. But what, what is really more scary, and even more, that we have a tremendous prediction increase about the cases, uh, more than to 106 million by 250. So our work, and I think the basic research responsibility is to invest on not only the treatment, but also to understand how the disease uh, uh, is evolving, initiating, and what is the precipitating factors of that. So, uh, I would like just to highlight that the big atrophy in the AD brain, which is at the level of dendrites in our neurons, as well as the spine loss, as you can see here, which is uh, at least, you know, uh, mainly shown that it is uh, attributed to amyloid beta and hyperfluorescence of tau, and we're going to see how later. Now, uh, tau is a mainly a cytoskeletal protein that it is mainly expressed in neurons and is predominantly localized in the axons, but also recent work from different labs, including us, have shown that we also have tau in the dendrites and spines. Now, what happened in, uh, in uh, disease conditions, such as Alzheimer's disease, we have the hyperphosphorylation of tau, the detachment from microtubules, which is uh, detrimental for, for the cytoskeletal stability, and we have the accumulation of tau that, as you can see here in this graph, it is misorted. Instead of being as usual in the axon, it is misorted in the somatodendritic compartment and inside the synapse, and there is a lot of mechanisms. We will see some that are toxic this for the neuron. Now, many predisposing or risk factors have been suggested for the disease, such as aging, which is the main uh, risk factor for the disease. There's a lot of genetic background. You listen some nice, uh, nice information, recent information this morning, as well as there are gender issues. Uh, at least clinical studies suggest that women probably has higher risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. And there's also a bunch of, of clinical and experimental evidence related with environmental parameters, such as the lifetime stress or chronic stress that were exposed. And this is where our work is based involved. But what is stress and how our body is perceiving when we are under stressful conditions? 
Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously stressed now that I'm, uh, I'm uh, speaking to you. So what is happening in my brain is that actually we have an activation of the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis that release the glucocorticoid hormones from our gland, uh, adrenal gland, which is on our kidney. And indeed, this is a very uh, a well uh, preserved evolutionary mechanism that it is very uh, uh, protective and homeostatic. The problem is that when we have an overexposure, prolonged exposure to chronic stressful conditions, that we have an overactivation of this mechanism, that it is clinical studies is correlating this with reduced hippocampal volume as well as cognitive function, that it is probably has to do with the fact that, at least as far as we know from preclinical and, and clinical studies, that chronic stress and glucorticoids triggered neuronal atrophy, so we lose the rights as well as spines, together also with reduced neurogenesis, the other uh, mechanisms uh, that we know that it is involved in brain plasticity and it's kind of a reservoir and giving our brain more neurons in order, in order to, to keep the balance by aging. So, and this results to memory deficits. Now, if you see more literature, there is a causal relation between chronic stress as, and depressive symptomatology and anxiety. And indeed, as you can see in this graph here, depressed patient has higher glucocorticoid levels. And, and in addition to that, many Alzheimer's disease patients also saw increased cortical levels and disturbances in the, in the whole stress system, what we call, uh, that uh, probably is suggesting that stress is a risk factor. Indeed, uh, the, the high cortisol levels in, in, in these patients are very nice correlated with the cognitive decline, where they are shown that these patients also have earlier onset of the Alzheimer's disease. Uh, as you can see in this graph, there is uh, Alzheimer's disease, major depression, and anxiety, share some clinical characteristics, which indeed uh, raise the question where this common symptomatology is underlined by common mechanism. I'm highlighting here a big meta-analysis study, for sure there are more and more recent. Uh, that's, that's, that's a nice one because it is more than 100,000 uh, patients in eight different countries that were very clearly so that depression can be a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And indeed, if you check in the literature, there are some links neurobiological links between the two diseases, such, for example, amyloid beta levels are elevating CSF of depressed patients and may, may uh, let's say, mark the transition between uh, depression and uh, Alzheimer's disease, where also importantly, another study shown that history of depression, so how many depressive episodes a patient has is also uh, related with the amount of amyloid plaques and tangles, so the two histopathological hallmarks of, of Alzheimer's disease in the brain. So, experimental work from uh, our, work, our lab as well as others have shown that when we expose experimental animals, mice and rats, to prolonged stress or glucocorticoid treatment, we have an activation of amyloid beta mechanism that results to, uh, to APP misprocessing that results to increase amyloid beta levels. And this also is accompanied by increased hyperphosphorylation of tau, abnormal hyperphosphorylation, as well as an aggregation that triggers neurodegeneration and cognitive impairment. Now, recently, we also saw briefly that stress affects also, exposure to chronic stress affects also other parameters of tau pathology that are very, uh, uh, helping in the aggregation of tau, which is the neurotoxic, and such as the abnormal conformation of tau, the tau truncation by caspase 3, as well as, uh, as uh, reduce, reduction in degradation that probably is a trigger in this aggregation, but we don't know how. So our recent work that is now uh, uh, under revision, and to make again a whole long story short, uh, shows that uh, Chronic stress is uh, inducing the deacetylate 6 and the mTOR signaling, inhibiting autophagy, which is a basic mechanism that degradates big aggregates of proteins, uh, such as tau or alpha-synuclein or ataxin or hanictin. Uh, and, and this is also involving the production of the RNA protein granules called stress granules that are also now suggested to be involved in the aggregation process. And, Indeed, that, that story is saying that autophagy uh, deficits could be a mechanism of how stress 
is precipitating Alzheimer's disease, town-related Alzheimer's disease, with a potential therapeutic role for mTOR, and even more, it introduces uh, the translation stress response to a part, as a, one part of cellular stress signaling in the imbalance of tau proteostasis. So in other words, we're playing more now with mRNA brain uh, intracellular trafficking and how this precipitates tau aggregation. So in light of what I told you about the clinical uh, suggestion and, and uh, uh, studies showing that there is a common neurobiological basis between depression and Alzheimer's disease, and based on our previous studies on uh, Alzheimer's disease models showing that chronic stress activates this tau hyperphosphorylation accumulation uh, mechanism that uh, results to uh, AD and memory decline, we uh, then thought and wonder where the same tau-related mechanism is also involved to the stress-driven depressive symptomatology. And this is if true. If I manipulate tau, we can probably alleviate or attenuate. So this is what we did. We exposed uh, stress for six periods. So we are combining different kinds of stressors that has to do with emotional as well as physical stress that in a way resembles what's happening. Overcrowding. Mice hate overcrowding. Uh, we also hate overcrowding. We are squeezed in the metro. So as well as with restraint. They want to go out. They cannot stay like that. Uh, so with, and we did this stress protocol for in wild type and animals that they don't have tau, tau knockout animals. Just don't stay with these figures, just remember that both animals have the same physiological response to stress. So what happens when we are stressed? I mean, in humans also happen the opposite. We usually, animals lose body weight. Unfortunately, I'm gained body weight, like others of us. But this is a very characteristic as well as the increase of stress hormones the corticosterones, and this is similar between wild types. So the cellular physiology and the organism physiology between the two uh, animals are very good. So, so far, so good. Now, but what happened with what we were, our question was, what happened with depression? What happened with the cognitive deficit that are comorbid? So we use a broad battery of behavior testing. I'm just showing a few. For depression, we main uh, check the two uh, hardcore characteristics of a human depressive symptomatology, which is the lerhelplessness and the anhedonia, the lack of pleasure, the lack of doing something that makes you happy. And as you can see, so the black is the control animals, uh, the red is the stress animals. As you can see, we have an increase of this immobility of doing nothing with animals in these two tests or climbing that represent uh, or mimic depressive-like behavior in animals. And that's well established and well known. But notice that now, in town knockout animals, chronic stress cannot induce anymore this kind of depressive symptomatology. And the same indeed when we check for anhedonic behavior. So we give anim the animals uh, the choice between sucrose and water, and for sure they go for sugar. I go for, sugar, for chocolate for sure. But uh, they, they are doing the same. So, but what stress is doing is, as you can see, it reduces this pleasurable. So it's, it's an index of another parameter of depressive symptomatology, anhedonia. But, and again, town knockout animals were resilient to what stress is doing related with depression. Similarly, we also check different uh, uh, type of memories like reference, recognition, spatial, and other more. Again, when, as we expected, chronic stress is inducing memory deficits in these animals by reducing different parameters, technical details of, we can discuss it later. Again, the absence of tau in different tests block the effect was neuroprotective against the detrimental effect of chronic stress in our brain. Okay, you tell me, John, you're right. Okay, that's just behavior. So was what happened with the brains. You told me, I told you, and you know that, that we have an atrophy uh, under stress conditions, the same in depressed conditions. So is it the same? What happened with that? So what we need, we check again the our cells, and we see, for example, as expected, that we have a big atrophy in the neurons. And this is, in reality, what happened with us. So when we have clinical studies with students under the period of, of stress, and they're usually when they go for, for exams, especially the medical students that they're finishing, it's very hard. And we can see these ringets in the brain. And then, uh, six months later, we scan them again through MRI, and we see that there is recovery, because it was a short period. Now, what happened with town knockout? This is absolutely 
completely identical to the control, as you can see here. We don't have this atrophy in the dendrites, neither do we have the synaptic loss in the neurons. So, in other words, again, tau was neuroprotected at the structural level. Now, we did a different bounds of analysis uh, related with neuronal connectivity. I don't want to go to, to many details. This is HPLC for measuring neurotransmitters, how the neurons are communicating, or uh, the uh, LTP, it's a kind of mechanism for synaptic plasticity, or even uh, MRI enhanced for measuring hippocampal function. And as you can see, in all conditions in wild-type animal stress, which are the red, we have a reduction, we have a damage of the neuronal connectivity or hippocampal function, which is not found in town knockout or in the connectivity was a bit less, which indeed can, we can discuss later why, but it is more to the connection level of how our a complex, our brain works. So, and for sure we have to check what happened with tau. So, Again, schematically here, I summarize everything so to make things simpler and faster. So when we expose our animals to stress, what we see, we have an increased uh, hyperphosphorylation of tau that it is accumulating in the cytoplasm, and this leads to mishorting of tau to the synapse. So we have increased uh, total tau and phosphorylated isoforms in the synaptic compartment as we have uh, a very nice protocol for uh, separating the synapse of the neurons and analyze them. And this was also confirmed by electron microscopy analysis and quantification. When we saw, as you can see here in the graph, that uh, exposure to uh, stress or glucocorticoid levels push more tau or localize more tau in the synapse and the dendrites. Now, at the next level, we also see that when tau is moving this, it brings together fin. Uh, that it is known to phosphorylate and activate glen 2 b and stabilize it there related with excitotoxicity. And this mechanism is only found in, in uh, a wild type, but not on one. So in summary, what we think is happening, or one of the mechanisms uh, that it can underline synaptic toxicity related with stress, driving depression, has to do with the hyperphosphorylation of tau, and it's misorting to the synapse together with fin that activates glen 2 b and this results to excitotoxicity. Importantly, this mechanism is not found in absence of tau. Again, give us another parameter or another example of how uh, a reduction of tau or absence of tau can be neuroprotected against different diseases as it is suggested. So that was one part of the story in a way that brain plasticity does not only give us, you know, uh, atrophy, uh, and the problem that stress is doing in our brain is not has to do also with atrophy of pre-existed neurons, but as I told you in the beginning, we have also a uh, suppression of neurogenesis under stress conditions. So briefly, and in order, because of the time passing, uh, what we see also, uh, we see that we have a reduction of proliferating the new neurons, you know, uh, that were uh, generated uh, in here in the adult dental gyrus of hippocampus. And we know that this is involved, as you will see later, in, in, in different cognitive functions. But uh, again, the absence of tau was, uh, was, let's say, blocking the suppressive, the neurogenesis suppressive effect of stress. Uh, interestingly, this specificity on tau mediation of deleterious effect of stress on cell genesis of newly cells born in, in adult hippocampus. Uh, it was only in neurons where, as you can see here, astrocytes and astrocyte fate was equally affected in animals that they have tau, like wild types, and in animals that they don't have tau, meaning that uh, tau is probably exclusively, uh, uh, how can I say, increased vulnerability to, in our conditions, stress-driven pathology uh, in neurons. And in a way, it could be make a bit of sense in a way that neurons express a lot of tau, where astrocytes express little and probably cytoskeletal changes or stabilization astrocytes could depend less on tau. Still, we don't know too much about that. Uh, so we suggest here, uh, based on, uh, on molecular and immunofluorescence, double and triple analysis, we suggest that you know, uh, we found a tau-dependent suppression of PI3K. This is a, a pathway that is known to regulate cell survival uh, and proliferation. And this, as you can see here, has a very nice out behavior output in the animals. So animals, wild-type animals under stress, has a problem that has to do with, with what we call in animals pattern separation, that it is a behavior test involving dental gyrus function, where are the, the newly born neurons are generated. Where, again, Town did not express that. 
So in summary, uh, I gave you uh, at least today three different mechanisms through, uh, uh, through which stress is precipitating neuronal and synaptic damage and leading to depressing pathology. And in other words, we saw you some tau-related mechanisms that we know until yesterday that they were existed only in Alzheimer's disease, and now our studies support their involvement, essential involvement in stress driving, in the establishment of stress driving depressive pathology. And indeed, this is part of what, what, what we're building many years together with Osborne Almeida and Professor Nuno Souza uh, in the University of Minho, uh, based, which is summarized in a way on, on that scheme. You know, there is a lot of discussion about a continuum between uh, cognitive and mood disorders. And the, clinical, the, the clinicians can, can, can tell you more about that. I'm not a clinician. However, uh, we have, as you can see, by aging, we have a decline, for example, of the mood and cognitive status that sometimes has to do uh, with also with spontaneous depressive activity. Where what we believe, uh, based on our gender and genes that can interact with stress, the cumulative effect of stress, that as much as more stress as we put through the neuronal malfunction atrophy can be the connecting parameter between depression and pathological uh, push to AD through common neurobiological mechanisms. So I would like to thank the team uh, that is involved, especially Professor Nuno Souza, uh, our collaborators. And if there is any take home message, is get rid of your stress and enjoy the nice view of Lisbon. Thank you again. We have time for some questions and discussion. And speaking of the view, since we're not showing anything, I will ask you to uh, get the view up. Pode subir as cortinas, por favor. Questions? Hi. Thank you. Very nice presentation. Um, for Yanis, uh, I, I probably missed it, but do you have a quantification? So, so my question is simple. When you are in the tau knockout mice, is it that you are avoiding the, the stress-related changes in the brain, or are you avoiding the stress at all, the stress response at all? Do you have a? I, I couldn't. I, I don't know if I saw a glucocorticoid uh, yeah, yeah. measure, for example. I, I saw it. Uh, I saw it in the beginning. So uh, the physiological response uh, related with the HP axis driven, as well as the body weight reduction which is normal for uh, uh, response of our body response or animals' body response to stress, as well as the increased cortical level or the hyperactivation of the axis. The three, four different parameters were equally between uh, wild-type animals and town knockouts. So it, in other words, that what is telling us is that uh, we, we, where we have the same stress physiology response between the animals, the deletion of tau or reduction of tau could be neuroprotective against the detrimental uh, effects of stress on the brain. And this is not only hippocampus, we have also other, uh, other uh, areas analyzed like prefrontal or amygdala that have different effects. So in general, that, that was showing us that there is a specific uh, vulnerability of the neurons that probably can be to the very fine but also very weak uh, partner, which is called tau. And this is going along with other literature supporting recently that uh, the neuropathological role of tau is involved not only in Alzheimer's disease, but also in epilepsy. As you know, there are some studies in epilepsy or excitotoxicity, glutamate involved in excitotoxicity. Uh, the neurogenic story, another example, but has to do also with acute stress. For example, uh, Jesus Avila and Maria has done an excellent paper uh, published in EMBO, 2016, so that even acute stress is, uh, the changes of the acute stress in the neurons, uh, in neurogenesis level, again, is, in, is mediated by tau. Or even that environmental enrichment, which is a positive uh, thing that I think, I'm sure I, a lot of you discussed the clinicians on, on the social part of the meeting, also involves tau changes. So, in general, I would say where the periphery is not attached, is not involved in tumor, I mean tau exists in liver. Uh, but we don't know exactly what it's doing. And at least for the brain, we think that tau is the weak link. It's a very fine protein doing a lot of stuff, but at least under, under chronic 
uh, stressful conditions, not only physiological stress, what I present you, but other cellular stress conditions, I think Taos is an essential regulator of, of neuronal pathology. Ioannis, thank you very much. Great talk. So I, I had a, a, couple, a real question and then a provocation. Uh, uh, so the, the first question is, in, your, in, in your, your later slides, in your description of the depressive-like phenotype in uh, rats, I believe. Mice. 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 Um, uh, the cognitive component is, of course, also part of uh, what we as clinicians see in depression. Right? The, the, of course, the, uh, one of the major differences, which is clinically very relevant relative to neurodegeneration in Alzheimer's, is that we can reverse that deficit by treating the depression, and we really don't have that in uh, Alzheimer's disease. W if, 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 if what you proposed in your last slide, that this is a continuum, is true, what is the tipping point? And, and now my provocation. That's what already should, one million, one million I, dollar, you know, question. What shall I, tell <laughs> I, my, I know. What shall I tell my patients who have depression about Alzheimer's disease? Okay, uh, as you see in the last slide, we have a threshold, and and it's true. We have discussed many times with uh, 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 Professor Avila, uh, uh, also Medina, that there is a part of town that is responsive for the neuronal plasticity, and a part of tau that is responsible for neuropathology. One part can be reversible, can be reversible. If you take the, st the stressful stimuli, phosphorylation is going down. But there is a part that probably that involves truncation or more toxic aggregation that is not reversible. So I, I think that the, the fact that when when you cannot do a lot is based on the fact that we already reached a limit that we don't have real reversibility on the, on the specific neurons on the pathogenesis, and, and on the pathology, sorry. And this has to do, uh, I think, with the threshold. And I think this is what we are looking for, the point of no return. Uh, now, why the depressants are not working? Uh, uh, there are studies showing that there is regulation in APP misprocessing. I don't know anything about tau. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm not a fan, honestly speaking, I'm not a fan of the classical mechanisms that the presence are working. For example, uh, work, work developed lately uh, from, from, from us in Minio showing that, for example, a, a serotonin um, receptors and um, uh, SSRIs can revert aggregation of ataxin. And I know that's work also happening with, with tau in different. So uh, I want to see, uh, to, to see the clinical studies that you are doing in more careful ways. I don't, I don't know how exactly, in which conditions they are. And most of the cases, do you think that the depression is one unique stuff? So there are many parts that we call today depression clinically that probably fits to different parts. I'm, I'm showing you one example of, of one model of what is depression in animals. The, stress-driven depression. That's the HPA-driven depression, but it's not all of that. That's why, that's why some patients, they don't respond to a dexamethasone test or CRH test because it's involved in it. So in a way, I'm, I'm trying to say that there are many parts of depression, so we have to be more careful about this connection. What you will say to your patients, uh, yeah, they have an increased risk, uh, especially if, if they're not treated. I don't think that antidepressant itself has to do with this stuff, with, with reverting uh, tau uh, phosphorylation. At least we don't have any evidence up to now. I don't know any, any literature on that. But it is important to stop earlier depression, if you can. It, it, we have a problem also with that. 40%, as you know very well, of the patients do not respond to the drugs. But it is critical to try for that. The increased risk of Alzheimer's or increased risk of neurodegenerative disease, dementia? My knowledge is to do with uh, Alzheimer. I don't know, I'm not a clinician, I cannot tell you. I know for Alzheimer for sure. But it may be that the different location of the different pathologies 
may play the role to define the final disease? I think what, what clinicians are defining depression uh, or, or overall how it is going to change in a few years in a way that we need more tools to image live brain. How many types of depression? Uh, how many types of depression? View live imaging of all this transition between depression and Alzheimer and which kind of Alzheimer, which areas are affected. Do you have motor, motor uh, problems and deficits involved starting or later in the disease? That means circuit changes, not as dynamic one area. And I think this is, this is something that uh, Professor Nuno Souza is trying to, to see, the dynamics and the brain connectomics, how they change by disease. Because what is happening is we just see a behavioral output, but does not really confer what is happening is in the brain connectomics level and how swift the brain by aging as well as by pathologies. There's one question on, in, I really liked your, your behavioral uh, model um, in, in the rodent. There's, but of course, we start thinking about, about humans and, uh, and we start thinking about um, are there any good retrospective studies uh, linking uh, Alzheimer's with, uh, with depression in similar backgrounds. Are people uh, with Alzheimer's people that uh, suffered a higher than normal stress than their peers? And are there any good twin studies that could, uh, could let us uh, separate the are genetic you factors from If you're the... a clinician, please give me an answer. I'm <laughs> telling to our clinicians to start checking more carefully uh, when uh, and how all, all these parameters, when the depression comes, you know, the problem, the problem in Europe, and I think it has to do also with the people that decide in politics of how we have to do, is that we don't have follow-up clinical studies for many years, which now, for example, Finland start uh, a project for 100 years clinical study. Then we have a lot of answers by following specific populations growing. Here we have, most of the times, we have more smaller populations at least in Europe, we're not there to do a clinical study paid by state money for 100 years, do we? That's the challenge. But the data may be already there. It's just a question of getting the, the proper consent and ac accessing Probably. it. The patients exist. It's one of the, the, yeah. the biggest societal problems we have now. It would just be a question of looking back and seeing... Where I think we is. need better organization between clinical centers and, and universities in order of how they collect and how they, they put data together. Whilst you are thinking of other questions, I, I just would like to say that we have this afternoon a, a nice demonstration of several mechanisms in place for trying to explain symptoms and signs of one disease. And Eduard works with groups of cells. Manuel works with systematic linkways between regions of the brain which produce things that some we know what they are, and other molecules are known for us. And Ioannidis works with a little bit larger model and protocol. We have heard in the beginning of this afternoon something that reminded me of many years past. The iron is the worst beast in the inflammatory process that starts all the diseases in the brain. And I just wonder why you people don't talk about endothelial cells, which are the beginning of the brain, at the blood-brain barrier. This is the question for both of you, for all of you, the three of you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Flies. Flies don't have endothelial cells. That's true. What can you do? <laughs> Manuel? There's very little known about how not only cannabinoids, but also you know, lipid cues, arachidonic acid derivatives, and so on, control blood brain. Blood brain regeneration and stability and functionality. Most of these signals can cross the blood-brain barrier pretty freely. So they can also insert in the cells and they can travel not very far from the synapses, but they have a certain rate. I mean, they are not only autocrine or paracrine, 
uh, signals, but they can travel a little bit farther. But in fact, this is, that's a very good point, but I wouldn't I don't have any, any clue for, from my studies about how this Does could be. Does the PTH axis play any role in your corticostriatal mm, well, pathway? We don't know, in the, um, we don't know precisely uh, controlling cannabinoid signal in the corticostriatal pathway, but of course cannabinoids control the axis, the axis in turn control the activity of the system. But there is no study, and that's a very good point, of how, for instance, depleting CB1 receptors in different locations of the HPA axis can have different effects on, on the brain, and that's, that's a good point indeed. I think it's a good point, it's a good point to discuss with uh, Giovanni Marcicano, yeah. that was with me in Max Plan yeah. many years ago. Yeah. I think he has a background of, of stress, so that would be yeah, a, nice, yeah. a nice point of interaction, trying to understand the HPA axis dysfunction of cannabinoids. He has, and he has many papers, and but concerning stress within the brain, within the CNS, and also he has done some stuff with CB1 receptor blockers, such as Accomplia that was even approved by the EMA, and it was taken out from the market because of the psychiatric effects it produced. It. And also regarding peripheral stress, but as far as I know, he hasn't done, and he has no, mm -hmm. not in mind, how a more general peak of how brain can target the periphery, periphery can go back to the, to the brain depending on yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Continue, and if there are nobody else asking questions, on Friday we'll have two colleagues of us, all of us, talking about imaging tau in the brain. Okay? Um, nowadays we image the distribution of beta amyloid. What would you propose? Beta amyloid or tau, both of them, Tau first, beta amyloid after, or beta amyloid first and tau after? <laughs> I usually, if, if you're asking me, I, I usually use a scheme I didn't put here, uh, where, you know, for, for many years, I mean, most of you, you know, there was uh, a, a battle, a real battle between Baptists, the people who were, were believing in amyloid beta, uh, and that's, that's interesting for young generation, a bit of history of neuroscience of Alzheimer's disease, and Taoist. So Baptist against Taoist. I think if you see mine now, they go hand by hand in a way that uh, amyloid beta is necessary for having Alzheimer's disease, otherwise you don't have Alzheimer's disease. So it is a triggering parameter. I think we most of us agree. Uh, I, I'm happy to hear other uh, opinions. But tau is, seems, seems to be the final executor. And, and there is some experiment, not so much human, because I don't think it's, it's very easy to take my, to, my tau out of me. But uh, in general, I think there are experimental evidence accumulating now showing that tau is the final executor in, 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 uh, in AD. But I think they, you need both of them to have Alzheimer's disease. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we need money too also, that's true. <laughs> We'd like to thank the speakers for their